Hi everyone. Uh, not sure if anyone can hear me, but um, oh, I can't even see if anyone's coming in yet. Um, okay. I think we're going to have to start. So this week in politics, I don't know how much of you guys been able to see or know about, but um, I'm thinking that there is a lot going on right now and I think we all need to sit up, pay attention, particularly if they do call the election soon. Now, by all accounts, I do believe that when Scott Morrison comes back from the Glasgow um, Climate Summit in uh, over there, um, I believe he's going to call a snap election. But it's not just me saying so. So a lot of the online chatter is he does plan to do just that. And if he does, we have to be ready for any gaslighting that's done. He's actually going to go to the Glasgow Climate Summit with no climate policy. That's, uh, that's going to be embarrassing. I, I don't think this is going to go well at all. Um, so I'm just going to... Let's see if anyone is up. Uh, we will just get more people in. And hopefully they will join because I still haven't seen anyone quite join. Um, particularly if he does do this, it's it's going to be quite embarrassing. I I really really hope he doesn't talk. It, talking is such a really bad idea. I don't know what's beeping. Something is beeping at me. Um. And if this is how it goes down, um, I'm thinking it's not going to be a good thing. Okay, so um, in, in saying all of this, I think we're going to experience something really big here. I think this is the election of all elections. Like, I know before I said really, really, really big things about these elections, but this one really encapsulates in the middle of a pandemic, um, economic issues everywhere, and we have this group of anti-vaxxers and then people that are pro-vax, and I think you've really, really got a big lot of issues going around right now. And I think if we're honest... Uh, we're going to experience this for a long, long time. I really, really want to let you guys know this election is a game changer. Uh, we've been told that if we don't start taking action on climate change before, before 2030, we will experience issues way, way too big to undo. So there's definitely something big in this election, not just for climate change, for economics as well. They're failing the middle class and the uh, uh, lower poverty line here. The, the, the lower income here is really in big trouble. I mean, oh, I seen a woman the other day, she had a couple of bags on her and said, this is all I can afford. I, I don't you know, it's the difference between getting this and my medication and I had to choose food because i got kids. You know, it, it, this is really, really sad. But 
this election is going to be massive. Do not be fooled into thinking this is just another election. It's just not. Um, if anyone wants to pop on, and I don't know how many people can actually see what's going on here because I don't know how this works, and and have a chat about everything and see how it goes. I'm trying to figure it all out. So we're going to work it out all together, people. Um, th there's been so much exposed over the past 12 months alone. We've got everything from the police minister that took out Scott Morrison's bins. Um, I didn't think that that would lead to what happened to rape cases and particularly to do with uh, Brittany Higgins and um, Friendly Geordie's issue with the anti-terror police and so much more. I mean, this is the most appalling thing I've seen. I've seen one uh, posting about someone saying, They've corrupted the police way bigger than what I've ever seen. And I was like, yeah, some police do a bit of dodgy things, but not every one of them. No, they've taken whole police stations and ruined a lot of their integrity by behaving this way. They used the anti-terror police to go after friendly Geordies. That should have made people stop and think and go, whoa. You know, let alone the when they um, raided Annika Smithhurst's home over the uh, Afghan uh, story she did, and there was one other. I um, can't remember her name. But there was another lady that was uh, caught up in all of that. I think when we're talking about this sort of stuff, we, we've got to be really, really careful because... Now the police and the political arm are now moving as one, one whole entity. I, I think that that's an extremely dangerous situation. Um, and I don't think it's something that we should be kidding around about. This is real. Um, particularly with how they're behaving. Anyone that's critiquing the government, they kind of just nipping at the heels of them and it's it's deeply appalling i don't know how we got to this point uh and then you have to look at what happened with christian porter that vote alone changed fundamentally how we're going to see 120 years of of how we do things in parliament just changed um listening to the former commissioner involved in that um, was quite frightening. Hearing him say something like, this has never, ever been done before. I really wish I could play that, but I haven't figured out how to do it. Um, but hopefully this will be possible to show at a later date. This is super duper bad. Christian Porter shouldn't be running around um with secret donors, and if he was willing to quit over the secret donors, who the hell are they? And what interests have they got? And it, it, this means that he could be a national security risk. And to have the Prime Minister block that, like block that vote to find out what's going on, uh, it, it's never been like this before. Don't be fooled into thinking this is something that we've all seen. Um, and then we've got um, the ministers in mining shares. Now, this is a whole crazy story. So 21 nationals in government have more than a mere philosophical interest in the resource sector. This is an article from... Uh, crikey, um, five nationals, 21 MPs, five of the nationals, 21 MPs and senators 
own shares in fossil fuel companies. Analysis of the parliamentary register, register of interest in sheds more light on the deep ties between the Liberals' junior coalition partner and mining se sector from shareholdings to trips funded by fossil fuel companies. Now, let's stop and absorb what that means for a little minute. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot, a lot of ministers with ties to coal. And if we keep electing that, that's going to kill our planet. We, we don't, there is no Earth 2. We're not going to get an Earth 2. There's not going to be this moment where we think that this is all going to be fine. It's just not going to be. But let me go further than that. Okay. So the register with the MPs must update through their term disclosures, their properties, investments and memberships of the organisations and anything else that may create a conflict of interest. And it shows that while the nationals continue to stand in the way of a net zero emissions target by 2050, which is, look, the, the 2050 emissions target is one thing. Let me just put that out there. That It's, it's one thing to say, hey, we have this uh, target and, and we plan to meet it. But it's, it's so late like I need I need everyone to understand this is I, I, I'm looking at 2021 now and uh, we should have already been doing so much more already but because of this coalition government and the rolling back of the the carbon emissions trading scheme it, it's just gotten us nowhere we're, we're really in a real bad spot um Okay, uh, the register of the MPs and senators must update through their term, disclose their properties, their investments, memberships of organisations and anything else that they may create a conflict of interest. And it shows that while the nationals continue to stand in the way of a net zero emissions by 2050, and many of their party room have financial interest in the continued strength of their resource sector. National uh, leader... David Littleproud has said the resources heavy share portfolio and anyone in the party, he owns shares in BHP Mining Company South 32, Blue Energy Oil Gas Exploration Atlas Iron Ore Company run by Gina Reinhart. Oh, God. Which one of these idiots isn't attached to that crazy woman? You know, um... <sighs> that's that's alarming and it should be alarming to everyone else why because i believe that this is going to be something that is going to harm everyone and if we're being honest um there is no way that gina reinhardt can get away with doing this she knows her time is up she knows that if the government changes hands they're going to look into her interests, all of them. There'll be no choice. This isn't like we're walking around and pretending like um, nothing has happened. There is something big that happened with her role. Um, I know that she funneled a lot of interest into Barnaby Joyce and a few others. There were some secret under talks with her and Barnaby, but none of which can be confirmed. And I, I would never ever go there and say anything else it's it's just not appropriate uh okay he also has shares in ozenenko a-u-s-e-n-c-o an engineering company primarily serving in the resource industry little proud's dependent children are listed as having so his small children are listed as having BHP shares in uh, and South 32 shares. His small children. Uh, I mean, there'd have to be a reason that you, you involved your children in that, right? It, it can't be just a 
by accident moment. These things don't happen by accident. Regional Health Minister David Gillespie, who was promoted to the front bench after Barnaby Joyce returned to the party leadership. Oh, that travesty show again. Uh, has shares in BHP South 32 gold extractor Northern Star Resources and so does his wife. Who's surprised? I mean, honestly. Senator Perrin Davey, Susan McDonald have shares in BHD, Ken O'Dowd, who is retiring as member for Flynn in central Queensland, has shares in an energy giant, Woodside Petroleum. According to the section of his statement detailing bonds, um, debitors and investments, O'Dowd has interest in BHP, Rio, Rio Tinto and Caltex. So this is really, really big. I have no idea what is going on. Okay, so I can hear noises and I don't know if that's not good. Um, all right. Okay. Um, I wonder if having bonds is different to... Uh, I, the, the way that they're detailing it as bonds, I have to wonder, is that different to, to having it in shares or is shares bonds? I'm not really sure. See, my thing keeps going off. Uh, okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, one sec. Okay. Uh, hold on. Uh, it won't let you put a like on it. I don't know why. It, this is, we're going to get better as we do this. I have downloaded this thing called StreamYard and I'm trying to figure out how to make it show what I'm reading off and all that kind of thing so you can all follow along. Um, I think that that will have to be for next Sunday's thing and I'm going to do a couple of little things in the middle of this week to do like a midweek breakdown and that sort of thing. We'll have to see how this one goes. Okay. <laughs> this is this is where it gets really crazy. Um, after I uh, found out that O'Dowd had interest in BHP, Rio Tinto and Caltex, the register that also lays out the relationship between the Nationals Mining Company and Senator Matt Kennevin, you know, the fake coal miner look, you know. That guy. Um, and it, <laughs> the fake tradey sort of, I look like a real human person. Um, and it, obviously it's preposterous to think that he could be anything other than a grifter in amongst all of those people. Um, he's the most vocal advocate for this in federal parliament. But you have to remember, this comes from a prime minister who literally took a block of coal into the centre of parliament, just just walks up and goes, look, he's, oh, I've got a block of coal, like proudly. And the smile on his face. If you didn't see it, go back, find it, watch it, and understand that he, he has this look of almost like a, a criminal sort of grimace smile that's almost like, look, I can do this. I'm a big boy. And it, it's it's quite disturbing to think that this is what they proudly wear on, on their um, interests. Like, like this is something to be super proud of, that they're investing in a way to kill the, the, the planet. It's, it's so bizarre. I've never seen anything like it. Um, the register also lays out close relationship between mining companies uh, like Adani and Matt Canavan. Um, and the uh, with the coal extracted from its controversial Carmichael mine, paid him to sit in its corporate box for a basketball game in Rockhampton. In Rockhampton, of course, because you know, Canavan, it, this is just what he does, he, he, he must get you know, massive perks for doing really dodgy stuff. I mean, I'm sure that he proudly displayed that uh, photo or, or, or video that he had of the 
basketball game in Rockhampton. I'd love to know how that one went down. He probably thinks he's a rock star after all of that. <laughs> he's ridiculous, honestly. Um, so Keith, uh, Minister Keith Pitt also received a few per perks from the sector. This year, Santos paid for his travel to Canberra to Darwin and the sector paid for him to attend a resources event at Royal Hill in mine in Western Australia. It's unclear who paid for the who paid, but the mine is largely operated by Hancock Prospecting, which of course is another link to Gina Reinhardt. Look, um, I'm not sure how many interests Gina Reinhardt has, but let's just say it's enough to uh, kill a planet with. She's definitely got a hand in way too many MPs back pockets. But, I mean, it's not just her. There's Clive Palmer. There's Forrest Twiggy. There's all of them. You know, and Adani himself, he has got many issues with what he did in India. He didn't clean up properly and he didn't do a lot of things that I think that he should have. Okay. Um, when I'm reading this, can anyone actually see the video feed still or, or is it too difficult? Um, not really sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the Glasgow summit starts uh, soon. Okay. Uh, okay. Just one second. Uh, 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 Yeah, I think I really haven't done this right because I'm getting a lot of messages saying, look, I really, really can't see you. So what I will do is I'll, I'll click something I shouldn't have. Okay. All right. Where were we? That's what happens um, on a first live. You really find out how difficult this whole thing is. Okay. Um, it doesn't allow you to do much with these applications. Okay. The Glasgow st Summit starts next week. As a failure to the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to show up with a net zero target, as agreed by most economics and backed by big business and many Liberals will cause Australia's major embarrassment. I have to agree with that. There's no doubt in my mind that this will be a um, major embarrassment to us all. Uh, I don't think this is going to go the way that it should. Um, I think... Okay. Okay. Just checking on how things are, are turning out and I'm trying hard. Okay. Uh, to go there with it, no, look, uh, this isn't the first time we've been embarrassed. I think even Joe Biden doesn't know his name or interested in who we are as people because they understand that, you know, we're really not doing well as a, a country that's serving the climate or anything else. Um, and I think that that's really, really a big problem. And I don't see it improving any time soon. Um, the, the, the other issue is, is that they're not just invested in coal, but they're using taxpayers' money. Um, and a lot of it... There is, in every major poll done, 70% of the nation believes that we should be taking action on climate change. And yet when we reach the polling booth, how do we still have a conservative government? Someone needs to sit down and explain to me in clear, unequivocal logic how we have a conservative government, but 70% of the nation says out loud, probably should do something about that climate change, yeah? That's a weird position to have. I don't know where we really are with that. Um, the 
uh, it gets a lot from uh, lots and lots of places. Like the, this party gets a lot of money from a lot of places. The party is also a major beneficiary from donations from the research sector and was the only party other than the United Australia Party, you know, Clive Palmer's dodgy text message party that tells people that they must join, you know. Um, he's little, he thinks he's being a dissenter, you know, like um, Pauline Hanson, they all run around pretending that they were never liberals. No, you can't, uh, can't call them out on that, can you? And... Uh, you know deep down that they're giving all their preferences to the Liberals and they're trying to pretend like they're independents and they're not independent of anything. They're totally shot. Anyway, moving on. I think that there is a lot to get through tonight and I think that this is going to be uh, a very um, interesting night. If I can find my mouse, that would be great. Yeah, it just appeared for me. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is huh, who wasn't horrified to hear the formal, former Liberal Minister Prue Goward and her AFR article. This wasn't just sad. It had this moment of almost traumatic moment of reading the things that she says about poor people and how they live and how she believes that uh, it really goes. <laughs> I think talking about it is, is one thing, but addressing her as a whole needs to be done. Um, poor people, um, they vote, they live around you, they do go grocery shopping. They've got kids. And some of those kids end up really, really successful. So I don't think it's wise to run. A, I mean, Anthony Albanese has a great story about being raised in a housing commission home, if I remember. And uh, I think that that's fundamentally what we should be focused on. Just because you're poor doesn't mean that you're raising kids that, that aren't going to be great people. And they're all great people, whether they're delivering your pizza or whether they're running to be the prime minister of the country, they're all great people. And she needs to take a step back and understand life isn't built with everyone born with a silver spoon and it's not going to be. There isn't going to be this moment where... Um, Poor people have chosen that lifestyle. It's, it's not as if you wake up one day and go, you know what, screw it, I just want to be super duper poor and uh, don't want any help. I just sort of want to struggle it out here and I want my kids to suffer that same fact. That's not really how it works. Some of it is institutionalised. Some of it is uh, when you lose your job and you've got nothing and... You didn't expect to lose that job and you didn't expect to lose your home and everything that you had. The 2000 and I think it was eight crash should have showed everyone. Even the rich were tumbling down and a lot of people were, were experiencing heartache. This was no small thing. Um, and, and her comments are really, really appalling, but I will not be lectured by Mark Latham and his insane tweets about uh, Prue Goward. Um, doesn't matter even if he says something I like. He's a garbage person and he belongs to be in a garbage. Now, a lot of people are coming at me going, oh, yeah, but didn't he lead the Labor Party at one point? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he did. But he was such a crybaby about everything. It didn't even last. He doesn't have the real working class background. He has this idea that, you know, everyone owes him something. Well, he owed someone something when he broke their bloody arm. What an idiot. 
Um, so I'm not going to be lectured to by that idiot. He thinks violence is a way to solve his problems. That's on him. Most of us know it's not. A uh, very small part of the population actually partake in this level of violence. And uh, they all seem to be... That's you, great, but uh, I don't know anyone personally in my circle who would agree with that level of stupidity. But moving on, um, this is really about the Prigaud incident. Uh, look, I, I really, really want to make it clear this isn't like something that we should even have to tell people. We shouldn't have to tell people, treat poor people like ordinary bloody humans. We shouldn't have to tell people, hey, if you're helping a poor person, that poor person is still human. And even if helping that person may in fact benefit, will, will benefit the whole nation, but it, no, it'll benefit everyone to see what that person becomes when you help them out because a lot of the time once you've helped them out you, you see them really strive and move forward and try and avoid that pitfall again that's not always successful but there is a a moment where that can happen but um yeah there is that um then i want to move on to the grace tame stuff this is super duper sad because she has been treated awfully by the uh, media and treated as if, you know, her speaking out was not supposed to happen rather than uh, treating her like a person that was exposing just how dodgy everything is. Everything from Peter Dutton to Christian Porter to, you know, every scumbag in the LMP that wants to say something bad, I just said a bad word and I didn't mean to. But that's truly what I think of those people. They don't have anything positive to add. And if they couldn't see Grace Tain's story and see that it, it spoke to a lot of women and men and fathers, I spoke to a lot of dads and they had this opinion of, oh, my God, I just wanted to help her, you know, it, that's that's the opinion that I'm mostly seeing. Um, okay, just going to do a quick checking and see where we're at. Okay, where was I up to? Grace Tang. Okay, it's she's now doing a talk on child sex abuse, and she was. She got found out that uh, she was not allowed to take part in shaping the plan of this. Prime Minister Scott Morrison Thursday announced the government set aside $146 million for the first four years of the 10-year national plan, to which include extra law enforcement measures to support victims and survivors. And they didn't include it. Like, why not put your best foot forward in the best speaker for it right now um seems a little bit crazy if you ask me because she's got a lot of um cloud and people really resonate with her and instead of being decent humans they do what they do and they throw them to the wayside that's that's just how our government works and if we're not really careful this is going to be one hell of a show that's not going to be great. Um, Miss Tame rose to the prominence of uh, to speak about her campaign and the Supreme Court of Tasmania case to be able to publicly self-identify as a rape survivor. So she definitely is a survivor. She definitely is the woman that should be speaking on these matters. God knows who Scott Morrison's picked for this sort of thing. I have to hope that uh, he's consulting real people, real victims to, to come and lead the charge on this, to help other people it's, that are experiencing this kind of thing. 
Okay. Uh, I think the the childhood sex the child sexual abuse um, part that she wants to be involved in is also huge. She said that she hasn't been involved in any drafting of that either. But she's made several Twitter posts. So I invite you to go and check her Twitter. It's definitely worth a look. And I think particularly when you look at what goes on on Twitter, it's um, going to be an interesting thing to, to be discussing. Right. On to the next. All right. The Christian Porter Blind Trust. Now, as if everything else that they do, this has to be shameful. Everyone has to feel a little bit of shame about this. This is the government that people elected by and large. This this isn't like some small moment of, oh, well, they just accidentally got in. No, I understand that the tricks they played and the, 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 the stuff that they did to get in. But you have to understand there is a huge swath of people um, that did deliberately vote for this. So, and a lot of people don't seem to care about this blind trust stuff. I did a um, overlook on Twitter to see how many people really, really, there was like, unless you were super duper left leaning, there wasn't like this huge outcry to do something about it. Um, if I remember, um, in, in, in talking about that, this whole thing, it's going to end badly. 120 years of precedent just gone, you know, about how we talk about this stuff. We're in really big trouble. And, and I think that if we're not looking at this, we're going to see corruption threefold. If we're not going to address this, um, on Wednesday afternoon, um, the Speaker of the House, Tony Smith, a caution um, and considered person, according to The Guardian, um, examined um, whether or not the Privileges Committee in Parliament should take a look at Christian Porter's use of a blind trust to pay some of his legal fees. Uh, Smith's view was that there is an issue to examine the rash prejudgment of facts a merely procedural determination. Some Wednesday afternoon after question time, the Speaker allowed Labor to move the necessary referral motion and Smith granted the pre precedence. Okay. The veteran at Liberal MP, Russell Broadbent, the chair of the Privileges Committee, naturally assumed that border controversy was about to land in his lap because the government opposing the motion in his understanding would have been unprecedented in the history of the Australian Parliament. Now, take that in. It's unprecedented. This has never happened before. And then suddenly we're like, oh, you know, it's another week underneath the LMP. The more we normalise this, we're in real big trouble, real big trouble. But uh, he was in for a rude shock. Broadbent was in for a rude shock. Peter Dutton, the managing for business for the government of the house, opposed a referral. The government's numbers were mobilised to block the proposal. In case you've missed the whole saga, Porter and his blind trust, here's the short version. Part of Porter's legal fees, a defamation against um, the ABC, were paid by a blind trust. Now, if you remember... ABC published a story about uh, rape allegations and several other things that went on around that time and he tried to sue them. Then he cowardly, you know, backs out and realised, you know, he was wrong and he'd never admit that, but everyone was blindly saying he was an idiot. Um, so... I think to, to physically quit Parliament over these blind trust sources, there's going to be some major problems with this. 
how many more are going to have to resign? Because if he's got this blind trust, how many of them have them? We need to know what their interests are because this is going to be important. The arrangement was highly unusual, certainly unusual enough for Scott Morrison to speak advice on whether it breached ministerial standards. If he needed to ask if that breached ministerial standards, he knew. He already had that answer. He just wanted to, if you will, close the back door. Um, the ministerial standards require ministers to be unaffected in consideration of the personal advantage or disadvantage. He could be a major national security issue. And if he is, we're going to need to do something about that. And I don't know if here, like the US, that former people still get intelligence briefs and whatever else. For whatever reason, they do that in the States. I'm not sure if they do that here, but if they do, he could end up selling a lot of our personal interests to God knows who. Whoever handed him that money. Um, ministers must not seek or accept any kind of benefit or other valuable considerations, either, pardon me, for themselves or others in connection with performing or not performing in any element of their official duties as a minister. The standards say, ministers also must not come under any financial or other obligation to individuals or organisations to the extent that they may be influenced or properly perform to their official duties as minister. In the M. Porter's elected department, the ministry before the bureaucratic advice to Morrison came back. The former Attorney General and Industry Minister maintained robustly there was no problem. Of course they did. It's a little bit like saying, hey, I asked my guy, my guy said that there's no problem. My guy might have a compromising issue as well, but we're all just going to not talk about that because that's how this LMP works, see? They've got one guy to say, hey, just checking that this is, this is happening. Remember, when he was doing this whole legal battle, with the ABC and he stepped down for a little bit. Uh, if I remember correctly, he put Michelle uh, Michaelia Cash in, in, in the position of uh, Governor General with no legal background at all. That's on its face showing how much they take it seriously on anything. So if they're not going to take us seriously, why are we taking it seriously each election? We just shouldn't. The former Attorney General and Industry Minister um, maintained robustly there was no problem for the trust arrangement and he believed he had provided the information required under the Members' Register of Interest and Standards. Yeah, okay, what, what, what did he disclose? Because if it's a secret trust, he didn't disclose anything. Porter said he quit the Cabinet because he would not force his supporters who evidently wanted to remain anonymous. And, I mean, most of them show their hand, like um, Barnaby Joyce isn't afraid to say, yeah, you know, Gina paid for this or Forrest Twiggy paid for that or um, et cetera. They're typically not bothered. So who were they and what did they want? My question is, is not only who are they and what did they want, but was he giving them what they wanted in that moment? So one has to ask questions. I believe that there's more questions and answers to that. Okay. Porter didn't want the generous souls attacked by the social media mob. Yeah, because that's how it works. Someone might say something to hurt their little fee-fees for supporting a guy suing the ABC over claims that he may have raped people. That's exactly how this all should have been handled. <laughs> That's the kind of Earth 2 moment that we're facing. It. Like, hey, you know, we have this really bad situation over here and uh, we're just going to pretend like it's the people that are outraged over what we're doing. They're the problem. Not me who created the problem. And that's the ultimate gaslight of the whole thing, isn't it? When you're saying things like, hey, it's not the issue. It's you pointing out that I that I even did this. And you're looking around at the person and going, wait a minute. 
this wouldn't even be a thing if you didn't do that dodgy thing. That's when you know that they're truly gaslighting the country, not just environmentally with the whole dodgy gas plan. No, no, they're literally gaslighting people into thinking, no, no, if I tell you, it, you know, the people might be mean to them. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. But uh, they get to prove any of that stuff. Okay. Uh, ultimately, he decided that he had to break the choice, uh, make the choice between seeking pressure to tr uh, of the trust to break individual confidentiality in order to remain in cabinet, or alternatively, forego my cabinet position. There is only one choice I could, in all conscience, ma uh, make. Porter said late September, like, oh, poor me. I had to resign because I did something bad. And feel sorry for me. That's as bad as watching Gladys Berejiklian and lie on the stand at the New South Wales ICAC hearing. Like, yeah, feel sorry for me. I lied to you, but feel sorry for me. You're kidding me, right? This, this, this is a real statement coming from a real minister talking about a real problem he created all on his own, all on his own. And all he had to do was go, you know what? I don't mind. And it kind of tells you a lot about his lack of integrity and the people who gave him that money. To me, it, it speaks volumes. It, there's no other way to discuss it. Okay. Manager of business, Tony Burke, told the chamber, unless the committee was able to reach a determination of the trust, which he likened to a brown paper bag, good job, Tony Burke, because I think that's what it is. I think that's a good description of what happened here. Stitched up by lawyers. Exactly right. I, I think that if we're going to have any real discussion based around this, we need to have it said that uh, there was a cover-up. And, you know, they're forever going on about the whole Eddie O.B. thing and they're, they're running away with a hell in a handbasket with this, but you can't point any of that out to any of them. Now, Burke is very obviously intent on maximising the government's political discomfort over this, and as he should be. I mean, geez, it's, it's about time they felt a bit of heat, you know. It, this government has skated so many things. Like when they handed, I don't know how many people remember this, they handed the uh, trust to the Great Barrier Reef $500 million or something crazy, and it, they they couldn't get the money back and it really wasn't for people preserving the Great Barrier Reef. Where is that money? Nobody knows. No one can get it back. There's no chance of any of it. That's my point. This whole thing where they're handing out money after money after money, no one knows where it goes. No one knows where any money is being uh, brought in from other interests. Now we've got this going on with Porter. We've got endless rorts. You've got them buying shares in, 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 in vaccine and then pretending like it's no big deal and then they shut down the production and the vaccine. Don't say a word to the people about why production would be shut down. Now, I'm not questioning the efficacy of vaccines. Of course, I'm, I'm double vaccinated. I've got everything done. But that's part of the issue. They do all these dodgy things after dodgy things and no one holds them to account. So when Tony Burke is like, hey, I think this looks bad. Absolutely, absolutely. There's not even a doubt in my mind that this didn't just look bad. It stunk to high heaven. There was no way around it. Um, okay. A member of the House set up a blind, house, a blind trust and whatever income they want to go into it, receive income so then they say, oh, it's a blind trust. I don't know where the money came from. Now, Burke was... Um, trying to Tony Burke was really really trying to point out that that shouldn't be a thing but you know I'm amazed that uh the speaker of the house um didn't do the whole you know ALP be quiet let's just keep them quiet because there is a lot of that um whenever ALP tries to hold them to account the speaker of the house goes well no we've heard from you enough that's that'll be all you know 
made a little bit too much of a stir and people actually saw it because believe it or not it is viewed quite largely um not just political acolytes you know people that are really really into politics look at it lots of people do look at this stuff and i think that we look at this stuff because we realize it's it wasn't until tony abbott got elected that i was like no we're in a lot of trouble ever since then it's been nothing but trouble but i think for life now i i, I even talk to my kids you know um i've got one that's an adult and another that's a teen i don't hide that um and i tell them all the time you know this is going to matter for a long time for us all anyway back to the article uh Dutton tried to um inoculate the government against wednesday wednesday's a very bad judgment call by revealing he'd already written to the broad ben to asking him to consider some of the broader issues in disclosure of the crowdfunding, I mean, Peter Dutton on his own is just a, a slimy individual and you wouldn't trust anything that he said. You know, it could have been at that moment where we realised that it was all going bad and then he goes, no, 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 I already did this and then later on it will be found out that he actually didn't. The government insists Porter's blind trust is encompassed in Dutton's instruction to the committee. But th this means that Dutton actively helped this. Um, but taking the manager of the government of the business at his word, he asks for what broad range clarification exercise rather than a specific binding about a particular arrangement. One sec. I'm just going to take a sip of water. Excuse me. So rather than queuing know, applause and expressing eternal gratitude, gratitude, to St. Peter, we all should instead be very clear about what happened on Wednesday afternoon. Porter's blind trust issues should have gone to the Privileges Committee. Now, I don't know how much power these committees have. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they do, if someone can inform me of quite how, how powerful they can be, but from what I understand, it's not very... Nobody has anything to fear from the conventional deliberative process of the parliament. This is no big deal. This is how the system is supposed to work. An inquiry would have been an entirely routine after examining the facts. The Privileges Committee is troubled by the blind trust precedent. And from my vantage point, there is a bunch of reasons why it shouldn't be. And then it could have set some boundaries. But instead, we are stonewalling. We've had the sound of wagons being circled around the LNP. And we have the appearance of the government sweeping something important under a rug. Now, you'd roll your eyes and say unbelievable, but what if we saw this on Wednesday? It wasn't so crushingly predictable. Uh, I think this is, this is something that we all need to sort of absorb the seriousness of. This is a Guardian issue, uh, Guardian link written by Catherine Murphy, a wonderful writer. Um, and it really, really outlines everything that we've got going on right now. Um, and I think we've really reached a pivotal point of, of where we are. I I, I can't stress enough that we are in so much trouble right now um and i want to make it clear this isn't normal um we're not living in an ordinary time that's why i'm doing this we're not living in a time where this was something we could easily overlook if we were this wouldn't be happening okay Next, I want to talk about how the Prime Minister and fellow, fellow Cabinet members, members see welfare. Now, they're calling welfare the old age pension. Now, remember, working people spend their whole lives, their whole entire lives paying into that. That's their money. That's money invested in their future. That's what it was designed for. 
So if the Prime Minister and Senator Rustin wants to run around and uh, call this a welfare payment rather than what it is, an investment into people's retirement, she's got real issues now. Um, she's calling it a generous amount of money that the Australian taxpayers make um available to our all of Australians. When pressed on the comments, Senator Russell said in terms of the amount of money that taxpayers fund social social welfare system, we put a lot of money into it. Yeah, that's not her money. It's not she's living literally off her her terms of welfare, of being part of the government, which don't mind that, you know. They need to be paid for what they do. But it's a bit rich coming from people that are literally living off the taxpayer, telling other taxpayers, hey, if you ever need this, we're going to treat you like you're a problem. And truly, truly awful. It, it's, it's, it says a lot about where we're at. Um, not just for us, for everyone. We're really, really at this point where I don't know how good things are going to get unless we change government. We we have to change government. Um, and I, I want to talk about welfare not being this dirty word or something that you just say to people because, you know, it felt good at the time. Um there's also another story I wanted to talk about. Okay. Um, just trying to find it. I had it all teed up and now this is where it all goes wrong in the second half of my live stream. Either I've gone too far down. Uh, I think I did awful okay just one moment okay now the job keeper issues this is another thing that I want to talk about as we're opening up and there'll be issues around job keeper and job seeker and all that kind of thing just remember that the government largely allowed big sums of money like huge sums of money to go out into parts there that never needed it like jerry harvey he received a lot of money um so when we're talking about what this means and how big this thing is, I think it's important to know that um, this isn't something that's that's going to be easy to deal with. Um, the money from JobKeeper was going to businesses who didn't need meet the criteria of profit loss over the course of the pandemic. The motives are obvious. The government was receiving advice from peak businesses on setting up and administering job JobKeeper. $40 billion in public money was being transferred to big business. It is a rort, to, uh, rort that they've now done, one of the biggest ones in terms of... Did you know $5 oh, sunglasses and the $500... I don't know if anyone heard that. That was really loud scared me um i i just wonder if if this had been labor that did anything like this how it would be perceived it's super important to remember that labor never would have even gotten away with a third of what's happening here um i think very few companies gave it back and they had no intention of doing the right thing here but even if we looked at that, uh, 
just going to talk. Um, one sec. Okay, here is a good timeline of exactly what went wrong. Okay. And I think this will give everyone a good um, indication of exactly what we're looking at. Okay. Uh, he. Uh, okay, so the review of the Reserve Bank that JobKeeper saved hundreds and thousands of jobs throughout the pandemic. But these conclusions are not normally mutually exclusive. JobKeeper is both the largest rod in Australian history and the most successful job saver ever. A timeline upon the scheme shows it was plagued by scandals from the start. In March, on March 30, 2020, um, this is an article from News Daily, um, after weeks of pressure to unveil a wage subsidy program in response to the national lockdowns, Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced a $130 billion scheme called JobKeeper. Payments of $1,500 a fortnight will be available to workers at their firms, depending on the size of their company, to see their turnover fall at least 30 to 50% during the COVID-19. Mr Morrison says that businesses will hibernate through the storm, which is how it was intended. But sadly... It went to a lot of places that it would seek, didn't need it. Um, and the government knew it had gaping holes in it, but it did nothing to stop what would go on to be the big issue. JobKeeper legislation passes in Parliament on April 8, 2020, with bipartisan support. The Treasurer then granted extraordinary decision-making power to decide who was eligible without parliamentary oversight. Now, pause there for a minute. Without parliamentary oversight. Does anyone realise how big of a deal that is? No one even just went, hey, you know, maybe we should look into who's getting that. But most importantly, we learned that two key features of the program that will result in tens of billions of dollars wasted in taxpayers' cash. Businesses won't have to prove the turnover. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Um, I had fallen. Just one sec. I need a drink. And well, instead, we'll be able to access the scheme if they predict the turnover will fall in the future. Like, sure, this would have been a really, really, like, this was a wonderful thing that they did. Okay. Once businesses are accepted, their eligibility will not be rested. This means that they can continue accessing payments for the duration of the scheme, no matter how the sales or profits improve over the next six months. Oh, a week in confusion regions. By April 15th, 2020, uh, within a week of the legislation passing, widespread confusion emerged over the scheme's rules and eligibility criteria. About 800,000 businesses expressed intent in signing up, sparking a scramble at the tax office and a, to ready its systems for the deluge of applicants. So this meant that there was always going to be someone that did try and grift this. But it didn't help that Josh Frydenberg was like, look, just give me the ultimate power and, you know, there'll be no oversight to this. So we could catch it in real time. And he knew that that would be the case. Um, remember when the ALP did the stimulus checks and they were so outraged and they were like, you know and this is with Labor doing full disclosures over who got everything. Like, like dead people are getting it and everything else. There's very few and far between. And that's how stimulus checks generally go. Um, and to pretend like Labor had this really bad thing. Anyway, 
that ended up being one of the most successful stimulus packages that we ever had. Now, to watch this play out, you're like, no, nah, hold on. Something went terribly wrong here. So within a week of the legislation passing, widespread confusion emerges. About 800,000 businesses express interest in signing up, sparking a scramble at the tax office and it's in systems for a deluge of applicants. Eligibility information is changed amid growing concern about JobKeeper rules. Mr Morrison urges people to dob in a business that will break in the rules. I, just, he didn't mean like his buddies that were doing it. No, no, no. He meant like mum and dad businesses that may have gone a couple of dollars. Over. That's what he meant. I, I cannot be convinced otherwise. There's no way that he, that's not what he meant in, in that talk. Okay, the, <laughs> the confusion will have major ramifications for workers with many at Dimmix and Harris Scarf left out of the program. Now, I'm not sure why places are left out. I don't know what both of those companies are. Um, okay. The mad rush to sign up in April 2020. Um, April 20th. The ATO officially opens up JobKeeper to applicants. The system is immediately plagued with issues, complaints about confusing process and reports of mistakes made on the important ATO forms. Never, nevertheless, hundreds and thousands of businesses manage to sign up for the very popular program. Job Keeper mirrored. Uh, hold on, I think I skipped something. Hold on. Okay. Two faces of the ATO. From May 1 to 9, JobKeeper payments begin to be paid in arrears from April. Within a week, more than 700,000 businesses are enrolled and 4.7 million workers are receiving four nightly payments. The ATO said it will show mercy to businesses that made the mistake on their applications and will respond forcefully to the JobKeeper Okay. The ATO sparks another bout of criticisms. After revealing delays in the process, first round of JobKeeper payments. Manipulated cash flows. By May 15, 2020, Treasury data, which would later turn out to be wrong, claimed 6 million workers are being paid under JobKeeper. Reports emerge that businesses manipulating cash flow to access JobKeeper when they otherwise would have been ineligible. Prime Minister Scott Morrison admits there'll be some things to sort out once Treasury reviews the JobKeeper program. The ATO alerts business owners that the scammers are trying to steal JobKeeper. Now, do keep in mind, every program has something up with it. But this one seemed to be extremely extremely pliable to these rules because of course Josh Frydenberg wasn't going to make sure things were okay when has he ever made things okay that's just not how they do things the biggest accounting bungle in Australian history we'll learn that the data on JobKeeper after being reported is wrong the ATO and Treasury admit 60 billion bungle that saw them over in uh, the count amount of workers being paid because of mistakes made on company application form. This reduces the scheme $130 billion pricing tag to just $70 billion. Now, that's, that's a really, really, really big issue. They didn't even, like, try to hide that this this was like okay they overcounted the amount of workers being paid because the mistakes made the company's application forms they weren't even like tracking this properly but of course they've fudged the numbers because they always do and then they pretend like they're helping you and then still new zealand's you know 
back in a black campaign to pretend like everything's okay. And, and none of it's okay. We're really in big trouble. Two workers at Village Roadshow become an example of the broader fight over the industrial relations side of JobKeeper. Employers had been asking if staff to draw on the small annual leave entitlements, which stood down after receiving wage subsidies. This must have been done with, with the reasonable agreement of staff. But disputes over what constitutes reasonable soon led to dozens of Fair Work Commission disputes. Village staff lose their bid to claim it was unreasonable for the employer to request drawdown annual leave retirements. Other employers such as Qantas Retailer, H&M, also took ARC staff to draw down on their leave entitlement sparking union outrage. Now, why was that such a big thing? Because this wasn't like they were choosing to take annual leave. This meant that the moment that everything rolled round again and, you know, we became good. These people couldn't go on holidays with their families for whatever reason afterwards because we'd been locked down so long. Some of these people would have wanted to go on holidays. Hell, even I've now, like, looked at, you know, sneakily looked at the holidays and thought, oh, geez, I would like to go somewhere, you know. And that this is someone in my, you know, always staying home, don't really go nowhere kind of mentality and wearing a mask and, you know, I I haven't really gone out over the past two years, but I wasn't huge on going out to begin with. But now I think that the fact that I couldn't sort of alter that perception of thinking about how I want to do it. Okay, the childcare centres were kicked off JobKeeper on June 7, 2020. Mr. Morrison unveils a plan to kick childcare centres off JobKeeper because, you know, according to him, must have meant little kids couldn't get COVID and their employees, you know, in his weird little baby brain mind. The industry is a special case announcing a special support scheme for businesses, but childcare centre owners fear the change will leave them worse off. He also says JobKeeper won't be extended beyond September. Spoiler alert, it was ex extended. So the data drip began on June 11th, 2020. Treasury released data on JobKeeper scheme. It revealed 844,000 businesses receiving the payments, totaling more than 12.9 billion more than the 3 million workers. The Grattan Industry Indus, Indus, Institute, sorry, publishes a critique of the JobKeeper recommending a series of changes. Okay. Oh, geez. Now it gets super interesting. Now, do keep in mind that when I say this, I am not religious and I do not um, partake in anything that is religious, although I respect everyone's right in how they pray and what they do. Um, and I really want to stress that I will never ever mess around in that world of it okay priests on job keeper on June 17 2020 the ABC publishes a first story exposing how many companies didn't need financial su support it finds out Catholic priests are among those receiving wages subsidies because of course what I mean couldn't the Vatican tide them over for a little? I don't know. I don't know how that would work. But there definitely should have been a better way of of handling that. But our Prime Minister seems to think that religion's uh, the only thing that's important. Hence why he wanted to open up super quickly so he could attend his religious viewings of his beliefs which I don't have an issue with I have an issue with him trying to force the country open prematurely because he wants to attend a church and that you know doing what we're doing now wouldn't be possible as if viewing it on a screen wouldn't be the same as actually being there sure the experience wouldn't quite be the same but you would still get the general feel for what was going on I have no idea why that was done like that 
The dodgy application blitz. On June 24, 2020, the ATO launches a blitz to, blitz to claw back hundreds of millions of dollars in JobKeeper payments that went to companies that shouldn't have received it. It becomes evident that the ATO could not closely scrutinise the applications in April and was commencing a mass order of the to identify the wrongdoing. The ATO says it received thousands of complaints about JobKeeper fraud within 41 days of the application opening. Now, I don't know how many people are listening. I think it's time that I sort of took a moment to thank all of those that are still touching on it. And we're at 8.15, so we're a little bit over an hour in, and I think if you're still part of this, excellent. Okay, what part did I just read? Um, okay. On June 24th, the ATO launches a blitz to call, call back hundreds of million of dollars um, in JobKeeper payments that went to companies that shouldn't have received it. It becomes evident that the ATO could not closely scrutinise the applications in April and was commencing a mass audit to identify the wrongdoing. The ATO says it received thousands of complaints in JobKeeper and fraud within 41 days of the applications opening. Workers are underpaid. In July 7th of 2020, earlier confusion comes home to roost as it emerges the education firm Navitas paid too little job keeper to itself and its staff and mixed messages from the ATO. If you can hear that, it's uh, my daughter in the shower. For some reason, it's on megaphone sound right now. The company agrees to back pay workers in agreement with the unions. Okay, elite school payout. Because, of course, what would be uh, anything less than handing elite schools lots and lots of money that they shouldn't have ever gotten. Journalists start to catch wind of even more JobKeeper rorts. The Herald Sun reports that elite private schools receiving JobKeeper, we eventually learned that the trend, the trend was widespread. JobKeeper 2.0 is born. Now, I don't know about you, but I get a little bit sick of the old 2.0 uh, part. Whenever they call something new, that it's called 2.0, as if that's the magical number that they seem to talk here. I'd like to know where the number came from because... Uh, quite annoying and it's done all around the world this 2.0 thing strange treasurer josh Friedenberg unveils a new vision of job keeper he sends payments until march of 2021 it's under two tier model that will provide less support to fuel businesses um than the original program can i just stop for a moment to see who actually can see any of this? Put a one up in the chat if you can actually, if you're still part of this. I don't know how many are actually. Oh, I think I've only got one person here. Um, I don't know on other platforms how it's going, but hopefully this will be more popular as it goes along. Okay, uh, JobKeeper 2.0 coincides with Treasury reviewing, finding that $20.3 uh, billion was paid in JobKeeper to 920,000 organisations to June 23rd, 2020. About 3.5 million workers received the wage subsidies, Treasury says. At the same time, in New Zealand, public rate wage subsidies register Reveals big Australian employers like Harvey Norman um, receiving money underneath their scheme. So if I get that part right, New Zealand's public wage subsidy that big Australian employers like Harvey Norman, why did New Zealand... So that means New Zealand also played a role in paying that, does it? Oh, geez. 
Okay, so then some of the rules are relaxed. On August 11th, the 15th, 2020, corporate earnings session swings into gear and JobKeeper becomes a topic of national conversation. The term dividend keeper is coined to explain the trend of publicly listed companies reporting higher profits and paying for dividends after receiving JobKeeper payments. Smiggle owner Premier Investments becomes a key example after it reported 11% increase in the profits taking on JobKeeper. The Age also reported that the high fee collections are taking JobKeeper. Uh, high fee colleges are taking JobKeeper. Naming and shaming begins on September 1, 2020. As the outrage grew, Labor MP Andrew Lee tells Parliament about a string of large businesses paying bonuses after receiving JobKeeper payments. I think I went too far down. Ah. I think I went too far down and something bad happened. Uh, sorry, guys. Just okay. On August, I don't think I was up to August yet. I think I was up. To, Was that for August? Okay. On July 21, 2020, um, Treasurer Josh Friedingberg unveils a new version of JobKeeper. He extended the payment until March 2021 under the two tier model that will provide less support for fewer businesses. JobKeeper 2.0 concedes coincides with Treasurer Review finding that $20.3 billion is paid in JobKeeper to the tune of 920,000 organisations to June 23, 2020. About 3.5 million workers received the wage subsidies Treasurer saves. Um, I think that's there. Um, Mr. Freidingberg also decides to change eligibility tests to allow firms gains and trust JobKeeper 2.0, showing the decline in turnover over one quarter rather than two. The cost change cost $15 billion. By August 11th to the 15th, corporate earnings sessions swings into gear and JobKeeper becomes a topic of national conversation. The term dividend keeper is coined to explain the trend of the publicly listed companies um, reporting high profits, paying dividends after receiving job keeper payments. Okay. By September the 14th, unions urged the government to crack down on job keeper rorts. Um, new JobKeeper rules released afterwards that had no longer allowed the project turnover declines as an actual turnover beyond September 27th. Businesses will also have their eligibility for the program retested and the turnover to regularly assess in the new scheme. The JobKeeper bill hit $55 billion. Remember as they're talking about this, they're worried about how much money this would cost. They weren't talking about the lives that would have been lost if we hadn't done this. And then you've got the Americans that hyperbolically say that Australia needs to be freed. And, you know, remember, this is during a pandemic. So as they're having this discussion, this is a pandemic. So when they're like, hey, we paid out money. This was to make sure people stayed alive. Remember, just over 700,000 um, people died in America 
due to this. So this isn't like, you know, some small little things happened. There was some major, major problems with this um, and the way that they spoke about it. And I think we all should be very, very outraged of what this is. You know, they, they're making it sound as if handing out money to people at a time that they actually need it is the bad guy, which, you know, if we're honest, it's, it's a way of keeping people alive. So later on um, they can be better performing taxpayers or, or what have you. The Treasurer of your job people, Keeper payments hit $55 billion in September 14. About 3.6 million workers are receiving the payment in the weeks before JobKeeper 1.0 and JobKeeper 2.0 began. Qantas caught in a disgraceful abuse. On September 24th, 2020, it was revealed that Qantas loses a court case over the way it's paying JobKeeper to staff. The arrangement that the airline had been paid workers less than it should have received, according to Jeffrey Flick. The Transport Workers Union calls it a disgraceful abuse of the JobKeeper system. As JobKeeper 2.0 kicked in in September 2020, the largest shift in the lifetime of the JobKeeper scheme occurs first as the phase ends. Now, I'm getting noises again, and I'm hoping it's about this, but... We will see. No. Okay. Um, I think that the um, this is going to be something that we need to talk about a lot more. This pandemic really could have been a lot worse and we're still in the middle of it we haven't even opened up yet we haven't reached the vaccination points that i'd like to see i'd like to see the whole country reach 90 percent. and when i say 90 percent, i mean like with the kids as well I, I don't want to be opening up schools and then saying hey you know kids you're cool my daughter is done just putting it out there my 14 year old is done and i was lucky enough to have my children done i i walked into a vaccination hub they took her within two minutes she was out you know sitting on a chair waiting her 15 minutes with a pfizer dose so when i did it i thought this is the time when i was truly feeling like everyone in my home was getting a little bit safer Look, I'm not going to pretend like this thing is going to be the absolute be-all and end-all of beating this pandemic. Uh, I think it's going to be around for a while and the variants are going to be there. And I don't think we should be just opening up. I think that there should be testing hubs for a while as well as vaccination hubs. I believe that we're going to spend the next couple of years mucking around with this vaccine and hoping that the vaccine becomes more resilient as variants go on. We've never experienced anything like this, most of us, in our lifetime. We have never, ever um, had the unfortunate moment of talking about what happens with um, an event like this. For instance, in the US, they had a 1,000 teachers die. A thousand teachers that just, that's a number that you can't. Kids, what are you going to tell them? Oh, you know, you had this wonderful kindergarten teacher, but she sadly didn't make it, you know. And, and what about for high school kids? You know, all of these kids had someone that they bonded with. And don't tell me that these kids weren't bonding with those teachers. Believe me when I tell you, my 14-year-old, I shouldn't get too personal, but my 14-year-old talks about bonding with these teachers. These teachers weren't just people that she's seen in her day-to-day -day life. I will put it to you like this. She rocked up to school 
And if anything was going on with her, they would know. They would know as quick as I would. And in conjunction with that school, there was open dialogue about how we would treat it. So don't dare anybody come at me and say, oh, it's just a couple of, you know, there was always going to be casualties. Of course there were. But that didn't need to be this bad. Over a 1,000 US teachers they've got over 700,000 dead and we're sitting here kicking around like it's a football, a political football about whether JobKeeper was this all good or bad thing. Are you kidding me? That, that shouldn't have even come up as a, as a talking point. It should have been people needed this and there definitely should have been oversight as to who got it because I can tell you a lot of good people were locked out for very, very bad reasons and a lot of smaller mum and dad businesses missed out on desperately needed help. But if you don't believe me, go and talk to the public. They've got a different situation in discussing how we're dealing in this pandemic. Um, And I think... When we are discussing this pandemic, be absolutely clear, absolutely clear. There isn't a person you should want to give up for the freaking economy. There isn't a life I'm willing to go, here, take that guy. Even if it is the likes of Andrew Bolt. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to call it out like it is. Even someone like Andrew Bolt, I wouldn't want him to be thrown under the bus of the economy. Why the hell were we talking about our grandparents like they were disposable? Why, why, why were we talking about nursing homes as if they shouldn't have been more protected? This is not something I want to kid around about anymore. And, and, and to have this illegitimate debate about whether you're vaccinated or not. Unless you're a virologist, please spare me your moment of pretending like you know what's going on. I don't for a second know what's in the core products of anything I eat. I haven't sat down and piece by piece looked at everything that enters my mouth. And I can dare say 95% of the population does not take that time to do it. Or on the alcoholic drinks that they're consuming on the weekend. They're also not taking into the amount of drugs or other issues that they're taking you wouldn't dare look at a prescription that same way so why are we looking at this vaccine as anything other than a life-saving entity that not only saved the lives of millions of Australians at this point we should be thankful that we have the ability to access that vaccine but let me digress further there are poor countries around the world that are desperately seeking that vaccine. And we've got entitled idiots walking that street and pretending like they've got something special, like they know more than the scientists. Well, I'm here to tell you, not only do I not know more than the scientists, but I trust them. And why do I trust them? Because every other time, everything from my eyesight to the way that I learned things is thanks to science. My eyesight is what it is because of science. All the mother vaccines that prevented many other diseases is thanks to science. I'm never going to give up on science. It's always going to evolve. There are going to be glitches along the way. But they're not going to screw around with this. And if they were going to screw around with this, Keep in mind, you had the rich jumping, gnawing to get to the front of that line. They weren't just sort of going, hey, can I have a vaccine? No, no, no. You had Rupert Murdoch at the same time gaslighting Americans and Australians and the people in the UK. Hey, no, no, you can't have it. You know, you shouldn't be getting this vaccine. Well, he's jumping on a plane into England to go and get it. Are you... Have a look at the Fox News studios. They are totally mandated to do it. Totally. I wouldn't be able to tell that looking by the Tucker Carlson screeds of hate. But uh, if you want to take the disingenuous idiots 
that thought it was smart to walk in the middle of the road in the, you know, Brisbane and Melbourne and everywhere else. There are countries out there who still have not enough vaccine for adults. Keep in mind, we took vaccines that were designed for poorer countries from the US. The US was handing out vaccines to poorer countries and we swindled our little own bit from that. Now, that's there. That's all public reported. You don't have to take that from me. You can publicly source that information. You don't. If you needed me to tell you that first, I don't know. Something went terribly wrong. I, uh, let's be absolutely clear about what that means. It means that we are discussing the fundamental issue of whether JobKeeper was a big problem. And you had idiots walking the street going, no, no, no. you can't tell me to go and get a jab. Sorry, I forgot to inform people of this very important point. I have unwell family. Not just like a little bit unwell, I mean like really unwell. I didn't just take this vaccine for me. I took it for them. And then I took my kids in and did them. I have older parents, like most the population does and uh i did it for them too and they're getting done my parents are about to reach their second jab took them a little while dad had a couple of health complications that sort of delayed it and dad did it in solidarity with mum because she had a tiny little fee which i get it i have that too I'm scared of everything. I don't have a tattoo. I obviously have no ability of pain endurance. Um, and I'm, I did it. You know, I want to see the kids and the grandparents all together this Christmas. I, I, I want to see, um, Overseas families start to unite. But I want to do it the right way. I don't want to do it because a few bogans decided to walk the streets and do that. Look, I have digressed enough into the vaccine talk. But we weren't just doing this for our loved ones and opening up the country and the economy. We should have been doing it for ourselves. This is the first time your country asked you to do something to make sure it opened. The first time they asked you and you questioned it like, we're just asking questions. No, no, those idiots who were asking questions weren't asking real questions. I, there, were, there, there, there were several debates for me. I had one person that I knew from childhood openly say something like this to me. I won't quote it word for word because some people can guess that it's almost too close to home. <sighs> Did I know the compound breakup of the vaccine? No. No, I didn't. And I didn't need to. Because the same doctor who gave me my children, gave me my eyesight and many other things is the same doctor that said, you know, I think you really should have the jab. So keep all that in mind as we're all having this disingenuous talk with people that shouldn't even be heard. There are loved ones that right now I'm trying to connect with that are just asking questions. 
And if they weren't loved ones, I would have burnt down every possible communication with them up to this point. And I've only hung it out because I fundamentally can't give them up. But I don't know how much more a lot of us can handle that to get this country moving, to get ourselves moving, to put our kids safely in school. I don't know how much longer we can tolerate this debate of what's going on with the vaccine. I'm double vaccinated. There is no talk about me being magnetic or having anything special happen. Uh, nothing unique about... Uh, I didn't get any booster 5G signal on my phone. I mean, these are the ridiculous... They want me to have a real dialogue with people saying things like that. They want me to have that dialogue like we're talking about something real. Like this really matters. Like I'm about to go back to this timeline and... And I mean, even when they're talking about this clawback, right? Okay, let's let's go back to this timeline. By October 28th, 2020, the ATO revealed that it clawed back $120 million. It emerges that 800, uh, 8,000 businesses were notified that they were ineligible to keep JobKeeper despite being re accepted and receiving the payments. So we're still having this weird debate about who should have gotten what. There were always going to be issues with this. But now the government is going to use it to demonise anyone who received JobKeeper. See, they weren't too concerned if Jerry Harvey got it. They were concerned if real people got it. So now they're going to use this experiment to say, let's shut it down. Because they didn't care if Jerry Harvey got it. They really care if the standard person did because that meant that they could stay home for a little bit longer and keep their family safe. Now, I was lucky enough, like lucky enough to be the only one that needed to be out and about with what I do. Um, I was able to um, be the only one to run to the shop and get everything everyone needed. I was fortunate enough to be the only person that needed to do all of those things. A lot of families didn't have that flexibility. So out of four people, I was picked to do it. I'm the one who ran around with a bottle of hand sanitizer and wet everything. I didn't go as crazy as the US. Did you hear that they were doing things like putting disinfectant on their lettuce? Like, yeah, yeah. I love a good salad sandwich, but not with a side of disinfectant. Thank you. I would I wash my lettuce twice? There's this thing about you're not supposed to wash it once. You're supposed to wash it twice. Now I read it once, and I cannot remember where I read it, but I still do it to this day and wash the lettuce twice. There's something about the food handling services that sort of makes you do it. But there was no way I was going to add disinfectant to that. Um, so the scheme saved over 700,000 jobs. Um, and even when we talk about all of that, like, and they're talking about how much money they could get back, there were over 135 discrepancies, but it did save over 700,000 jobs. He rejoiced, like he was willing to take credit for all of the, the parts that he thought was wonderful. But remember, these, these things weren't instituted because the government was like, let's do this. No, no, no. Labor drew up a lot of this stuff. That was the big backdoor thing that was... How did Labor do up their stimulus packages? And that's what they modelled this on. So they modelled all of this off a of Labor policy. 
So keep that in mind. When you go to the election booth, you're going to remember, they didn't have a clue how to do any of this, which is why they weren't too concerned with oversight or who really got what or how it should have been distributed properly. But it was... For instance, do you know that Centrelink, this is a whole nother, I know that uh, we're nearing the end of the night, but I, I, do you know that Centrelink is uh, changing its uniforms and they're going to move a lot of people to the back of the uh, office, away from physical view? Now, I received this tip from someone inside Centrelink as I was trying to set up a... Um, it was a Medicare thing for Alyssa. Oh, geez. Um, I didn't mean to say names. Um, I walked in there and I was like, hey, can't access the uh, Medicare app for her. And I couldn't figure it all out. So we walked in there and they're like, oh, well, how old is she? And I gave her name and everything else. And they're like, oh, well, very soon we're going to have like this green and gold look. The logo is going to be different and they were wearing this different uh, badge. Anyway, as I'm, as I'm looking around, I'm realising that there's a lot of empty desks. Now, granted, this was 4pm and they do close, I think, 4.30 or something. And it was after school and I'd just taken the kids, one of them to a job interview and then another one to sort out this um so it was late and oh, by this point I was like oh you know everyone's sort of gone and then she's like no no, no we're re we're restructuring Centrelink so they're not only merge Centrelink with Medicare which is already shambolic you go in there and I'm going in, in there to ask about Medicare so she could prove that she had gotten her vaccinations now, because she's such a young lady, she's caught in this thing where she's not on my Medicare thing. She's on, she needed to have her own card so she could show for these interviews. She's going for to show that she has uh, the vaccine. Now, they're not asking her to do that. She's doing that because she feels like that will increase the job network. As I'm sitting there and I'm explaining our situation and the lady's like, oh, well, you know. And they were. this woman was so beyond helpful. She helps her set up the app. She goes through the, the creation of it all. And then, I mean, these people had been working a long time that day and they still had the nature to go and get help. And they're like... We haven't seen any kids walk in here and ask for their records yet. So we were wondering how this would go too. And <laughs> the Centrelink people seemed almost intrigued by it and there started to be like this hover of people, you know, and I'm watching it and I'm going, oh. And they're like, oh, look, uh, we can see that both of you are vaccinated. You can take off your mask if you want because you're both sitting down. I'm like, no, 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 thank you. Because I don't know their status and I don't know anyone else's status that's sitting in there. And uh, as, as we're going along, the lady pops up all of her details and we're done. And as we were going through it, I was like, okay, so what's going to happen? They're going to get new uniforms. More people are going to be forced into the back. This means those people that need that service, like I did to figure out how to get my daughter sorted, that's not going to be there. So go ahead. Pick who you'd rather vote for, someone who's going to put people out the back where you're not going to receive any help if you can't figure out what to do. In the end, the lady ended up having to print off her, the vaccination details because it couldn't be accessed. She's in this weird limbo thing. Uh, not old enough to see it on an app, but old enough to get her own card. It's 
government bureaucracy at its finest. Everything's a mess. Um, and then as she explained to me, well, I don't know if I'll be seeing you again. I might be the one that's heading out there. They're going to spend millions of dollars on uniforms to put them out there. Hmm. That's interesting. That's an interesting decision. Not one I would make. But they still want to have the disingenuous nature of discussing how this thing is going to be handled. I personally don't think this will be um, a great way of handling anything. Centrelink is a lifeline program. You're not rocking up there because, you know, you got enough money to survive on or you understand how the Medicare system works. You are walking in there purely because something happened and you need to understand what it was. And that's where we really got to. We got to this point where... Uh, started talking about people's frontline services gone they can't move that to all online i tried the online thing I'm nearly 40 and i couldn't figure out how that's going to work how are people that cannot use a computer are going to go yeah yeah no i got it <laughs> you know that's not it's not going to happen they're going to need a very very good storefront for this they can move a lot of services to online and it is very convenient. But I do not think for a single second that it's going to be as popular as they thought. Because it, have a look at insurance companies. Right? For instance, when you are with an insurance company, they say to you, you can, you can open up an account over why do they have so many storefront locations if they believed for instance racq is a thing you can just walk into an office and they're like hey how can i help you if they all thought online thing online was such a great way of doing it they wouldn't all keep these storefronts banks wouldn't still have their thing going on they would all have just the uh atm and the odd big bank manager that did their thing. Even they've had to keep a lot of stall people on. Why does Centrelink think that they're jumping the, the, the shark on this and then they're going to go, no, 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 we've got this. Yeah, because the the, the online experience is so freaking wonderful that that's, that's how that, that's going to all play out. So make no mistake, that's a joke. What they're talking about is an absolute joke. They don't really have a good intention about what they're doing here. It's uh, not going to be the greatest moment for these people to, to be walking in when they're already struggling, they're time poor, and now they're having to sit there and have all of these Cameras point them at, pointed at them, and they herded in like sheep. And uh, that's how that's going to go. And then they're going to be like, "No, no, not only do you have to wait a lot longer, but that's even if you can get help. They're forcing people to use computers that don't even have an online account." That in itself says, no, nah, it's, it's gone way, way too far. So in the end, they ended up kicking millions of people off JobKeeper. By November 29th, the Treasury data revealed more than 2 million workers went, to, went off JobKeeper after September 27th. Recipients fell more than 3.6 million to 1.5 million in two months. Only a handful of large businesses are now receiving payment. After the eligibility test ruled, thousands of companies are ineligible. Pardon me. Criminal investigations. 
In December 9th to the 20th, the ATO commences 19 criminal investigations into JobKeeper fraud. Now, that's going to be an interesting story. Watch that one because I want to know if they are big companies or little companies because I can bet you one of those names on the uh, indictments might be Jerry Harvey. If you believe that our government uh, plays in that nature, well, I've got a boat to sell you. <laughs> they typically do not work in those sorts of circles. Um, so in January 12, 2021, the second corporate earnings session since JobKeeper was unveiled, sparks a flood of large companies returning their wage subsidies. Toyota and Aluka Resources are the first companies to repay the debts that they owed. So we then figured out by January 18th to 19th in 2021 that the Treasurer was keeping a lot of secrets about this program. Public pressure was building on the government to require companies to repay JobKeeper if they booked higher profits and sales. The Prime Minister rules out forced repayments but said he welcomed companies repaying the money voluntarily. Days later, Mr. Freidenberg echoes the sentiment that a line that the government has held ever since. Because, of course, they, they, they didn't want Jerry Harvey to return it, even though he later did, after public pressure. I think I need a better chair for this. I've never fidgeted so much in my life. And I thought I did get a comfy chair. I did something terribly, terribly wrong here. Um, and I think the other thing is I'm not used to sitting this long. I'm normally up and about doing dishes and all that kind of thing. Um, Treasurer ruled out JobKeeper 3.0 on February oh, on January 31st, 2021. Amidst its staying criticism, JobKeeper brought Mr. Freidenberg ruled out extending the program despite fears that businesses still need help. The government sourced on keeping the wage subsidy going as the number of companies were reported of this um brought it as the companies reported to have rorted the scheme grows sorry about that you can hear that it's getting to the end of the evening audit office starts a review by february 28th 2021 we were looking at audits and found that the australian audit office um announces it's reviewing the job keeper program program Dr. Leah wrote, requested a pro. The deadline for the review is in December 2021. That's going to be interesting. That I think we should all be made aware of. The ATO reveals $340 million overpaid. The ATO reveals more than $340 million job keeper or paid in appearance before parliamentary committee. It says $53 million will not be clawed back. Because businesses tried to do the right thing, sparking rebuke from Labor senators, which <laughs> imagine if the shoe was on the other foot, of course. You know, we wouldn't be having such a disingenuous discussion. You know, the, the Liberals would be like, oh my God, <laughs> this is the worst thing ever. And the outrage would, I mean, Sam Dastiari resigns over $1,500. And people like Julie Bishop get half a million dollars. And they're like, hey, you know, keep her job. Everyone else didn't. And uh, same, same, right? <laughs> you know, um, by March 3rd, 2021, the New Daily reveals that a billion in JobKeeper was paid to more than 60 publicly listed companies. And recorded the profits and paid investor dividends and executive bonuses. Its first large scale analysis ex examining JobKeeper payments. It culminates it below in the, um, there's graphics in the New Daily um, article. Oh, geez. There's a lot of companies here. Blackmore's Channel 9. Why? Why? Why did these companies? Wait a minute. 
Oh, geez. Domain. Uh, why did carsales.com? So the online sales car place thought, hey, we can get in on this. Uh, La Vicia, I think that's a jewellery place. Super retail group. Uh, Bingo Industries. So why would they? Empol, the fuel company. Yeah, you know, because they were open the whole time. They, <laughs> as if you couldn't see that a mile off. NIB, the insurance, health insurance company. What the hell? Um, anyway, this has been an amazing evening. I hope you check me out uh, either through the week. I definitely will have a uh, another live stream, hopefully figured out how to share cast and everything else next Sunday. So it's been a wonderful time spending it with you and hopefully um, you'll check, you'll spread the word and check me out next week. So we can do our politics in review. Thank you, people. I am going to now find my favourite chair and just relax for a little bit before I've got to put the kids to bed. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.